Like all vaguely original, vaguely popular ideas, I will admit that this one is also a forced sequel. What? No, I'm talking about the subject matter for this video, the real-world follow-up to the Zanzibar hoax, the Dreadnought hoax, and even though we've basically already had an entire video of context, we're still going to need a little more for this one, and where better to start than the complex international political interplay of European navies in the first decade of the 20th century. You know, fairly light stuff. To cut a very, very very long story short, the first few years of the 20th century can be summed up by major European powers becoming increasingly distrustful of one another, and in doing so falling into two major groups. There's the allies of the Triple Alliance, which are the reverse of the ones you're probably thinking of when I say allies, made up of Germany, Austria-Hungary, Italy, and kind of the Ottomans too, but not really, don't worry about them, and the Triple Entente, Entente being basically a French word meaning alliance, if it wasn't confusing enough already, which is made up of the United Kingdom, France, and Russia. We just really need to focus on the rivalry between Germany and the UK for this video, but that's a quick summary of the European situation. Now, the UK at this time had the world's largest navy. Britannia ruled the waves, after all, and because of this, Germany, who was on the other side, felt rather vulnerable to them, quite reasonably, in fact. If it wanted to grow a colonial empire, as was the fashion, they needed a navy to keep the British from waltzing in and taking over, which we, I, I mean, they like to do. Also, if this tension broke out into a war, totally hypothetically of course, Germany would find themselves in a war on two fronts, one which from a tactical standpoint we know always goes swimmingly 100% of the time, and really the best way to get supplies in for the war effort would be by boat hence vulnerable to the UK. So in 1898, due to a lot of reason one and a little of reason two, Germany began to increase shipbuilding drastically. So if the time came, they could hold off the British in whatever situation it was. The UK was soon made aware of this plan and too began to focus on increasing their navy, determined to keep ahead of their rival. This is known as the naval race, a form of arms race in which both sides try to out-navy each other before any conflict had even begun. And in doing so, in 1905, the Royal Navy built the HMS Dreadnought. Since 1573, eight ships have had the name Dreadnought, coming from the fact the crew on board supposedly had nothing to fear. But this Dreadnought, our Dreadnought, was the first to be truly groundbreaking. Hopefully not literally though, when it comes to ships that's generally a bad thing. It's difficult to explain the intricacies of what improved in the Dreadnought in just a few words, and I know inevitably someone in the comments will write an essay on this anyway, but to cut a long story short, the Dreadnought was faster than other ships, had a different engine to other ships, could shoot better than other ships, and was built way quicker than other ships. These factors combined to mean basically every other battleship was outmoded overnight. There's a reason history remembers this group of vessels as the pre-Dreadnoughts, and in their place came the Dreadnoughts, ships based on the HMS Dreadnought and her improvements. So yeah, if the whole eras of ships are named after it didn't tip you off, the HMS Dreadnought is a pretty big deal, even to the point where it seeped into modern pop culture, from guitars to Star Wars to Super Mario Galaxy to Star Trek, and even now, a hundred years later, the Navy is still naming stuff after this ship, even to the point where I think I've mentioned it before. Cool. In 2028, they will begin to phase out and replace the Vanguard-class submarines with bigger Dreadnought-class ones, currently under construction. It yep, turns out all my videos are connected. Welcome to the Zephyrus Cinematic Universe, also known as History, I guess. Meanwhile, the fact that all of Germany's battleships up to this point had been outmoded, as it were, just ended up increasing the intensity of the naval race. As Germany was desperate to copy the innovations in their own dreadnoughts, it was highly important that the original dreadnought itself should be kept fairly secluded and away from prying eyes. Well, enter Horace de Vere Cole, a prankster and basically the protagonist of my last video. Around this time, he met with a friend that was in the Royal Navy, working on not the Dreadnought, but another ship called the HMS Hawk. From what I can tell, the crew of the two ships had a kind of friendly rivalry going on, closer to a prank war than an actual war, and having remembered Horace's previous exploits at pranking the mayor of Cambridge, came to him to suggest that he prank the crew of the Dreadnought on their behalf. He 
and I quote, took to the plan at once. For Horace, people who were stuck up or figures of authority were brilliant targets for pranks. The Dreadnought, since its launch, had become a grand symbol of the Navy's superiority, at least in the UK, and had a bunch of pompous naval officers aboard. You couldn't ask for a better target. His friend, Adrian Stephen, was also invited, and came to the lunchtime meeting with Cole and the HMS Hawk officer, and, because of the rather incestuous nature of the upper classes, was completely by chance related to an officer on board the Dreadnought. You might think, therefore, that Adrian would have some reservations about doing it then, but from what I can tell, he didn't mind at all, and even liked the plan as much as Cole did. Since the Zanzibar hoax the pair had done five years before had gone off mostly without a hitch, they lifted the plan for that and used it as a kind of template for this one. So if you've seen my previous video on that hoax, bear in mind this may start to sound oddly familiar. Now you might be wondering, why are you making this video if you've already covered something so similar? Um. Since their outing half a decade ago, the group had graduated, well, mostly, and Adrian had gone on to move to Bloomsbury and then to 29 Fitzroy Square in London, a terraced house about a kilometre from the British Museum and 600 metres from Bernard Street, site of another famous hoax. In these houses, he became part of a new friendship group known as the Bloomsbury Group. A set of people, including to name a few, Adrian's sister Virginia and eventual brother-in-law Leonard, as well as Roger Fry and Adrian's other brother-in-law Clive Bell, there were like a bunch more, but this video is long enough already, don't worry about them. Most of these people were writers, though Adrian himself only wrote one book. Horace was still friends with him in 1910, but the others that helped him in the Cambridge hoax had since drifted away, so this time round he obviously needed some more people. But whoever he got evidently weren't all that reliable, as all but two of them, Anthony Buxton and Guy Ridley, had by the day before pulled out. As Vanessa, Adrian's sister, recounted in a letter a week later, all was arranged when several hitches occurred and some of the people gave it up. They were beginning to think that they couldn't go. Cole was getting frightened and Adrian was the only person who was really keen on it. They found that there would only be about three or four of them, and they thought it wouldn't be enough when they asked Virginia to go too. She agreed, rather I admit to our horror, for Cole is really an intolerable bore. He's very rich and very vulgar, and he throws his money about. Then they got Duncan Grant to go too. Okay, I never said I did a good Vanessa Bell voice, okay? Shush. And since these people, especially Virginia, were quite pacifist, wait, no, scratch that, extremely pacifist, they were totally on board with pulling one over on the Navy. These additions meant the group numbered six people, which seemed enough, so they went ahead with the next stages. As ever, the plan was to disguise themselves and pretend to be an important foreign dignitary, this time on a state visit to the HMS Dreadnought, and fool the crew on board and everyone else into thinking that was actually true. But instead of pretending to be a made-up uncle to a prince of Zanzibar, this time they were to pretend to be the also-made-up prince of Abyssinia, also known as Ethiopia, Prince Makalen and his party. Which, on the surface, sounds fine enough. And even though three of them were educated in Cambridge, one in Oxford and one in King's College in London, absolutely none of them cottoned on to the fact it might be seen as a bit weird to be interested in a naval fleet while pretending to be leaders of a landlocked country. Though, the Navy didn't notice either, so it might just be me. The group arranged to meet in the early morning of Monday the 7th of February 1910, in order to get their costumes for the role ready. Since most of them were relatively wealthy, they could afford to be made up by the fairly well-renowned Clarkson's costumers, who usually served the theatres of the West End, and apparently their fitting was so notable that the owner, the great Willie Clarkson himself, came to superintend the fitting. Side note, while Clarkson's is no longer around, the old headquarters of Clarkson's still is in the form of a Chinese restaurant, though whoever took over the place evidently forgot to take down the sign. The costumes were to be fairly minimal for Adrian and Horace, as they were to play the interpreter and a member of the foreign office, respectively. Though, this was probably better than last time, as now they didn't have to heavily disguise 6'5 Adrian. 
Anthony Buxton was to play the prince, and Virginia, Duncan, and Guy were to form the suite, which consisted of considerably heavier makeup, clothing, and for Virginia, a fake beard. I cannot picture this scenario and not think Monty Python. <laughs> After finishing putting on their costumes, they all got a taxi from Adrian and Virginia's house in Fitzroy Square to Paddington, and then boarded a train to Weymouth, where the Channel Fleet and its flagship, the HMS Dreadnought, were moored. 59 minutes before they were due to arrive, they had a friend named Tudor Castle, and no, that's not a joke name, to send a telegram. This telegram signed Hardinge, who was at the time the very real head of the Foreign Office, and it was to alert the home fleet that the Prince was coming, that he wanted to see the Dreadnought, that he had an interpreter with him, and also sorry for the short notice. People who have watched the video on Horace's last prank may be getting deja vu by this point, because apart from trying to learn a few words of Swahili, a language not spoken in Abyssinia, like much at all, from a translated Bible picked up at the station, things were progressing basically point by point, the same as when they had done this before. Well, until now, because at 4.20, when they pulled into the station, they were greeted with a red carpet, barriers to keep potential crowds away, and a naval officer ready to salute the royal, all present specifically for them. If they hadn't realised that tricking the navy was in a different league to their other pranks, they did now. The officers greeted the prince and his group, then conducted them to a taxi which took them to the harbour, and then on board a small tender ship to take them on board the HMS Dreadnought herself, which, upon seeing for the first time, Adrian describes as smaller and uglier than he expected. Alright mate, calm down. Also, and I know I said I wrote this to be independent, but in their last prank, when they completely forgot to come up with a plan to get away, they just ran away. Now that was kind of off the table, because they physically couldn't. If they were found out, they would be at the mercy of the Royal Navy, or I guess the Fishers. And even though anything could go wrong, it didn't. Things seemed to go basically fine. When they forgot all of the Swahili they tried to learn, they reverted to broken Latin, which they knew off by heart thanks to their education. Hell, Virginia even apparently introduced herself as Prince Mendax, which is Latin for deceitful or lying, if that's not enough of a hint. I'm not sure if that fact is true. Take that last fact with a grain of salt, I can't find any primary sources to back it up. But either way, nobody on board spoke Swahili or Latin, it seems, because if they had, the game would have been up. But they didn't, and so it continued. When Duncan's moustache began to peel off, Adrian pulled him aside and reapplied it, and nobody noticed. Somebody could have seen him and realised that they were fake, but they didn't. When Adrian's cousin, William Fisher, eyed him from the other end of the ship, he very well might have spotted it was actually him, but he didn't. When Horace misheard what Adrian wanted his character to be called, as he had quite bad hearing, he ended up calling Adrian a different name throughout the whole tour of the ship. A distinctly German name, which was a big issue due to the whole risk of German spies sneaking aboard the Dreadnought. Remember that whole thing from earlier? The Navy might well have acted on that, or at least started watching him more intently, leading him to be found out. But they didn't. And when the group, having refused food because it might mess up their makeup, explained it away by saying their religion forbade them to touch food that wasn't specially prepared, everyone accepted it. Had someone been in any way educated about what that religion was, which was, by the way, Christianity, then someone might have said something, or queried further. Hell, there's a whole sect devoted to Ethiopian Christians out there, it's not exactly obscure, and I think I've even mentioned it before. In any case, someone might have easily started asking uncomfortable questions. But they didn't. And somehow... Some way, the group conducted themselves how everyone was expecting African heads of state to do so, and made it off the dreadnought without suspicion. The hoaxers had struck again, very much against the odds, and even had some fun with the scenario in the process. In fact, the prince, or Antony as I probably should be saying, refused a salute from the 12 inch guns aboard the dreadnought, because he understood that afterwards it would need cleaning, and it would be an absolute pain in the well, the aft, I guess, for the crew, 
Though, of course, that's not how it was told to the soldiers. But it was fine in the end. To refuse a salute from the flagship of the home fleet of the UK was way grander than accepting one, and actually acted very well toward making them fit the part. And one more thing of note, because the group had chosen such an obscure country, the navy had a spot of bother trying to get the anthem or the flag of Abyssinia within the 49 minutes worth of notice that they had. One flag that they could get, however, because of the very real visit five years previously of the Sultan of Zanzibar, was the Zanzibar flag. So it was that that flew on the mast that day, and that anthem that was played to welcome the fake prince on board which was actually kind of appropriate considering their history, don't you think? In any case, this hoax went off much better than the Zanzibar hoax, and this time they even had a plan for getting out of the act. This time the train was going in the direction they wanted, and being thoroughly exhausted, they returned to their central London home, ate, drank, undressed, washed, and ended the day generally happy. Nothing was heard for the first few days. There was no explosion of coverage, no great chaos, well, not immediately at least. Things were so quiet, maybe the group thought that that would be it. Well, not quite. In this nine-day margin, the Royal Navy slowly started figuring out that they had been tricked. That the real leader of Abyssinia, a chap called Menelik II, certainly wasn't the one that had visited them. That there never was a Prince Macalyn and that they had been had. During this time, the media also found out, likely not through the Navy, but instead through an anonymous informer, cough cough, Horace, cough cough, and on the 16th of February 1910, as Adrian Stephen was walking past a local newsagent's, he saw the front cover of the mirror, and a commemorative photograph taken of the group at the time, emblazoned on the front. Other news outlets quickly started picking up the story, and the media had a field day, again. But the attitude was slightly different to last time. You might remember I made a big deal and completely broke the flow of that video just to point out the differences in respect given to a keeper of a shop and a hypothetical royal institution. Well, that was to set this scenario up, because the Royal Navy was higher class and the people being hoaxed were men of honour, men doing their patriotic duty to their country, etc, etc. Pulling a prank on them was different, and it wasn't just harmless fun anymore. At best, it's in slightly poor taste considering the situation. At worst, it's anti-patriotic and is pointing out flaws in national security, ones which our rivals might abuse. This issue was so serious that the scandal was talked about in Parliament, likely in reference to how safe the home fleet really was. The reception to this one was way more mixed, and it would have been likely that if they did it while still at university, they would have been expelled. Luckily for them, they weren't anymore, and really the only way the Navy could get them punished was through legal means. Here's the thing though, nothing the group did was actually illegal. From what I can tell, and remember I am not a solicitor, is that there is no law in the UK specifically against the act of impersonation. The only two ways you can get arrested through that sort of thing is to impersonate a police officer, who have their own section of the police act dedicated to that fact, and also to use the act of impersonation to do something else illegal, like defamation or fraud or copyright breach. It was easy to avoid that sort of thing, as the prince they were impersonating was a fictional character, and in any case they had only acted with respect the entire time. The only illegal thing performed was the impersonation of Hardinge by Tudor Castle, but the navy couldn't really work out who he was, and thus the group itself, and Horace, had done nothing wrong. But the navy still wanted retribution, for being humiliated on the national stage in that way. So, instead of going down that legal route, they rather took things into their own hands and decided to punish them informally. First, the Navy had to find out the names of the perpetrators, and then they could dispense whatever justice that seemed fit. Somehow, it must have leaked, either from the crew of the Hawk or the papers, who a few of them were. But they had an easy way of finding out the others, as one was related to a naval officer. What luck! As Adrian later detailed, 
It was several weeks after the hoax when I was called down early one Sunday morning to see my cousin and found him waiting for me in the hall with an expression I found to be grim. He told me he had come just to find out who had taken part in the hoax and that he wanted us all to apologise. For my own part, I said, I did not mind apologising in the least if it would make things easier for the Admiral, though, of course, the others would have to be asked what they felt. My cousin asked me who the others were, and, innocent as a lamb, I gave them their names. I, of course, had been hoaxed in my own turn, for the names were needed for another purpose. Now they knew the full roster, they could do what they pleased. Virginia wasn't going to be punished because she was, well, a she, and that kind of thing went against the attitude the Navy had at the time, and Adrian, too, wasn't punished, perhaps because of his relation to an officer, but the others, well, they were fair game. Adrian never really saw Buxton or Ridley again. Which is to say, they lost touch rather than being murdered, I think, so we don't know if they had a special visit from the Navy. But we do know that Horace and Duncan were. In Duncan's case, he got interrupted in the middle of dinner with his parents by the arrival of some friends, and they then watched as he walked outside, was tripped and shoved into a van, which was then driven off at high speed. Just an average Sunday morning in Edwardian England. He was driven out to the countryside near Hendon, accompanied by, quote, three large men, one of which being Adrian's cousin, and once in an isolated area, he was caned. I can feel the viewers who know what caning is collectively wincing from here, and I'm just an audio recording, but not to worry. They obviously wanted revenge, but actually carrying out the act was a bit brutal. They were expecting a fight, and when Duncan basically put up none, they suddenly had reservations. You can't cane a chap like that, said one. Turns out they could, but only ceremonially. Two light prods with a cane, and then it was all over with. Duncan, who was in his dressing gown, remember, was even offered a lift home because they thought it would be embarrassing to ride the tube back in that outfit. Duncan went via tube anyway, probably in order to spare the awkwardness of that return car journey. The only other incident was with Horace, who at this time was actually quite ill. So that day, when certain visitors came to, well, visit, they again had reservations about caning a fairly defenceless sick person. No, not that kind of sick. So eventually, after some negotiations, Horace said he was happy to be beaten if he was able to reply in kind. Basically, beat them as well. They walked from his house to a quiet spot a few streets away where they weren't to be interrupted, tapped each other with a cane six times, then shook hands and went their separate ways. Apparently, revenge in the Navy's book is tapping a third of the participants a total of eight times with a stick. Yeah, not quite what I imagined either. And with that, really, the story of the hoax is over. No more weird sequels, and the group went on to live kind of long, kind of happy lives after the prank. Duncan Grant went on to be a fairly famous painter, with works to this day owned by various well-respected museums around the country and the world, like the Tate Britain, the National Portrait Gallery and the Met. Virginia Stephen went on to write a bunch of books that ended up being really successful, with titles like Mrs. Dalloway, Orlando, A Room of One's Own, and, oh, not again, and two years after the hoax, married Leonard Wolfe, thereby changing her name to Virginia Wolfe, yeah, that Virginia Woolf. Yes, I am saying that Virginia Woolf pretended to be an African royal for a joke, and no, I am not mad. Adrian Stephen, Virginia Woolf's brother, meanwhile became a psychoanalyst, and like his sister, also became an author, which is notable for us as in 1936, after the death of Cole and Adrian's cousin, he used the publishing house founded by Leonard and Virginia to publish this the only still existing primary account of the Dreadnought hoax, at least that I can find. It's 64 pages long and is very interesting. It's on Amazon and eBay if you want to pick it up for yourself and do some further reading. Speaking briefly of Horace, he seems to be the only one for whom these hoaxes were the highlight of his life, which is a bit sad, really. In any case, a while after the hoax, he moved to France and embarked on the last joke of his life, the one that time played on him. His first wife left him, his second wife cheated on him, his only son, that by the way went on to write Doctor Who, probably actually wasn't his, he grew very deaf and despite starting with a small fortune, 
died broke and alone in France in 1936, aged 54. Oh, I thought we were going to end this video on a happy note. Oh well. So, that's the story of the Dreadnought Hoax. Remember to like and subscribe, rate 5 stars, follow me on Twitter, and above all, thank you for watching. Except, not quite. There's one thing I have yet to mention that I feel like I need to, and it's basically tradition at this point anyway that I go off on barely related flow disrupting tangents, so why stop now? My pointless tangent for this video was to detail how the HMS Hawk maybe sort of definitely caused the Titanic to sink, which of course it totally did, look it up, but I actually think I've got a better tangent, and it all relates to two words. Bunga Bunga. Well, yeah, I guess that's technically just one. Also, that dramatic reading thing didn't work. I mean, just trust me on this one. If you know anything about the Dreadnought hoax, or have read anything about it at all online, you'll probably have heard of this part. A part so essential to the story, I talked about the hoax for 20 minutes without ever mentioning it. Apparently, when aboard the Dreadnought, the group had used these words of mock Swahili to mean, isn't it lovely, or something along those lines, and this was in turn pretty quickly picked up by the press, and passed instantly into somewhat of a joke. How silly the fake royals had seemed in hindsight, yet the Royal Navy had still somehow fallen for it. It was mildly catchy, recognisable, and rather funny, so of course that was the phrase that would be picked up by the media. Even today, when the occasional paper stumbles on the story and writes their own article, Bunga Bunga is the go-to phrase. Here's the thing though, I don't think it's true. In The Dreadnought Hoax, Adrian Stephen briefly comments on that phrase, and tells us it was picked up by the press when they interviewed one of the attendants at Clarkson's Costumers, an attendant that professed to know a lot more than he actually did. This is a person who was there at the event, in possibly the only surviving primary account of the event, telling us politely that the attendant is talking straight out of their arse. This is why I haven't mentioned it really at all while telling the story, since I don't think it was actually said, especially considering a much more realistic scenario was put forth. However, the public at this time did think so, and the stuff that they did with it was actually real. Initially, the phrase was very much tied to the hoax. Due to the tendency of papers to play journalistic leapfrog with each other, it featured prominently in many of the papers' coverage of the event, and many people shouted the phrase at sailors whenever they came ashore. Apparently, even the Admiral was followed by young children shouting Bunga Bunga, taunting him for being fooled. Maybe you can start to see why the Navy wanted some kind of retribution. But as the event faded from the headlines, so too did the expression, and for the most part it was used as an in-joke for the Navy years after, and in World War I when the HMS Dreadnought sank a U-boat by basically just crashing into it, amongst the telegrams of congratulations were messages from some ships that simply read, Bunga Bunga. But the phrase was more lasting than a Navy in-joke. From what I can tell, it stuck around somewhere deep in public consciousness as a way to mimic African speech, meaning that not only have I technically covered German-British rivalries and the use of blackface, now we're touching on controversial race-related vocabulary. Woo! If this video doesn't get demonetized, it'll be a Christmas, I mean, March miracle? Have I really taken this long to make this video? Wow, I'm lazy. So, after no sign of the phrase before, now, after the hoax, the phrase starts popping up sporadically in this particular context, from being featured in a Bugs Bunny cartoon in the 50s, and weird internet jokes that I'm not going to repeat, until things took an unexpected twist and the phrase was picked up by the then Prime Minister of Italy, Silvio Berlusconi. Yeah. I know, who reportedly loved telling that weird internet joke featuring the phrase and retold it at every party and conference he went to. After learning the word presumably from the joke, Bunga Bunga seems to have entered his vocabulary because it was also later used by Berlusconi to describe a vaguely African dance performed at some of his late night parties. So when it became known that the parties themselves were very, very illegal, in a scandal officially known as Rubygate, the media picked up on the odd name of the dance, and it became the de facto name for the naughty meeting Silvio was having. I added a massive epilogue to this video, so, if nothing else, I could feature newsreaders saying Bunga Bunga Parties Bunga Bunga His Bunga Bunga Parties Bunga Bunga Would you like to see the famous Bunga Bunga Room? Bunga Bunga 
Bunga Bunga Room. Bunga Bunga Sex Sessions. A lot. Which I think we can all agree, even with the weird morally shady history, will never not be funny. But in any case, now you know how Cambridge, Churchill, Zanzibar, the Dreadnoughts, Virginia Woolf, Titanic, and Silvio Berlusconi are all connected. And thank you for watching. Right, so I know this video is longer than the Yamato dynasty right now, but bear with me on these few notices. One, Plainly Difficult, who I've collaborated with in the past, has also made a video on the Dreadnought hoax. Feel free to check that out if you want a different perspective on these events. It's really quite good. Secondly, there was a banner at the beginning of the video, but it's worth reiterating that if you have any good ideas for an obscure but interesting story that would make for a good video, don't hesitate to suggest it. I put all the good ones in a Word document for future reference, though fair warning, if someone else suggests the Wilhelm Gustloff for the millionth time, I will stab them. Thirdly, if you've ever wanted to look something up or check a piece of info I use, then you can find all the sources I've used linked in the description, though nobody ever looks at them anyway, so I'm not sure why I'm saying this. And fourth, thank you for watching. Like, really. These videos often seem monotonous, boring, and take ages and ages and ages to come out, but occasionally I see someone make it through and even maybe learn something and that just makes my day. So if you do sit down and spend valuable minutes watching my videos, then thank you. I really do appreciate it. Well, that's all I have to say. I guess see you in six months then. <laughs>